Good afternoon. As we come to the final session of our conference on the Central Bank of the Future, it's fitting that we focus on the Central Bank of Kenya, a central bank that has been the forefront of policy and technological innovation to build a more inclusive digital economy. In 2015, The Economist magazine noted that it was easier to pay for a taxi cab with your phone in Nairobi than it was in New York City at the time. That first mover advantage reflects both the entrepreneurial spirit of Kenyan pioneers in mobile payments, as well as the forward thinking and measured approach that regulators at the Central Bank of Kenya took in response to the birth of the mobile money revolution. In that same year, in 2015, Dr. Patrick Joroge was appointed governor of the Central Bank of Kenya. In this capacity, he is the chief executive officer of the Central Bank and chairman of the Monetary Policy Committee. Dr. Joroge joined the Central Bank after a 20 year career at the International Monetary Fund in Washington, DC. At the IMF, Dr. Joroge's senior leadership roles included serving as advisor to the IMF Deputy Managing Director, as well as as Deputy Division Chief of the Finance Department. Prior to joining the IMF, Dr. Joroge worked in the Kenyan government as an economist in the Ministry of Finance and as a planning officer in the Ministry of Planning. He earned his Bachelor of Arts and Master of Arts degrees in economics at the University of Nairobi and his PhD in economics at Yale. Governor, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Chris. Governor, we're meeting today online rather than in person at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco because of the travel and public health restrictions in light of the pandemic. Now, the Central Bank of Kenya was among the first central banks in Africa to issue policy pronouncements in response to the pandemic earlier this year. The Central Bank announced temporary changes in transaction limits on customers, eliminated charges on transactions between non-bank mobile money wallets and commercial bank accounts. The central bank lowered interest rates, and it also instructed banks to activate their precautionary measures, what I think we in the US would call contingency plans, to ensure the continuity of operations. Now, clearly the central bank was thinking of many different potential pressures on consumers, on businesses, and on the financial services sector. When you're facing that much uncertainty in March of 2020, how did the central bank decide what to prioritize in its policy responses? Well, oh, thank you, Chris, and uh, thank you, um, University of Michigan, and obviously the Fed Reserve Bank of San Francisco um, for inviting me to this uh, event. When we were looking at the problem that was evolving um, in March, actually we had the advantage of having seen the problem evolve in China and Europe. And we had been monitoring quite, as we generally do, uh, developments around uh, the globe. And uh, that was something that we could see slowly evolving, and we knew it was going to come to us just as it did in uh, Europe, UK, um, and eventually, of course, the US, etc. So we already began thinking about it. And uh, one of the things that was clear at the beginning in terms of prioritizing things is that this is like no other, not only in terms of the um, the extent of the problem, but actually that it is about people. That was the first problem. Um, and you can imagine all the business continuity plans are all about systems. Um, this is a pandemic, and therefore the first issue was to protect people in terms of staff of the central bank, in terms of uh, um, staff in the commercial banks, and more generally the population. So in terms of prioritizing we had to deal with the policies that would do that. And uh, we, aside from uh, uh, issuing uh, guidance on, uh, um, let's say, how banks could uh, deal with this issue, meaning like having alternate work arrangements to minimize risk on their staff, uh, separation of teams, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, within, uh, within three, two weeks of uh, the virus getting here, the first case of uh, positive case of the coronavirus, we issued guidance, a guidance note to banks on pandemic response. At the same time, we also looked at the um, the, ben the the the, con the possible contagion um, through banknotes, and that's why we also benefiting from uh, being very advanced in terms of mobile money. Um, we put in measures that would increase incentives to using mobile money. 
This is things like lowering the cost at the lower end, um, also, for instance, increasing the limits, et cetera, et cetera. Thirdly, the issue of liquidity. Like any other crisis, liquidity becomes a real problem. And so we put in measures quickly um, that would increase liquidity in the system and in banks. So to date, that has not been a concern at all in terms of liquidity. And then there are the issues about uh, um, the, the shocks that would, uh, you know, the, the economic shocks, or indeed we, and therefore supporting the economy. So we put in measures like lowering interest rates, etc. standard measures. So I think the, the short answer to your question is that the prioritization was based on um, the, um, the, 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 this, the greatest, uh, I mean, how the, the greatest point of impact of uh, the crisis, people, uh, liquidity, and of course, more generally financial stability. Yes, thank you. Uh, you. You mentioned that you emphasized the impact on people and, and this was a crisis that's a little unusual from what central banks are used to addressing, a health crisis, as you said. And yeah. in your remarks uh, in public about the response to this, the pandemic, you've talked about the impact that the pandemic has had on vulnerable members of society, including women, and how women have faced some of the greatest burdens during the pandemic. Now, generally, central banks think about the state of the entire economy, but in light of what we're learning from the pandemic, what are your thoughts about the role that a central bank should play in responding to inequalities in the population? Uh, interesting question, Chris. Um, I think uh, as a consequence of this pandemic, inequalities in our economies have increased. And uh, now this is not exactly at the beginning a macro problem, um, but I think if uh, it will become a macro problem if left unaddressed. Directly, Obviously, this is a problem that is more on the government side, so fiscal policies and things like that to correct those inequalities. But we, on the other hand, are also handmaids of uh, those policies. And uh, in some sense, we have to look at the things that are close to us. From our perspective in the Central Bank of Kenya, and I think in other central banks like ours, we are very concerned of financial, about financial inclusion, and we've been pushing the agenda in financial inclusion. So it isn't just now an issue of access, it is also an issue of use. And that means we need to look at the vulnerable, at the groups where financial inclusion still is weak and apply specific policies. So going back to your question, women in this crisis have been hit the hardest. Why? First and foremost, uh, they are the ones that are involved in most of the, let's say, marginal sectors. So in the SMEs, et cetera. So you have a higher proportion of women in those sort of areas. And also the other ones that maybe lost their jobs that were, you know, that very, in various uh, sort of processing plants, et cetera, et cetera. Also at home, they are the ones that have taken the blunt of having the kids at home uh, instead of at school, et cetera. So what we have done and what other central banks are doing, uh, we are looking at uh, supporting specific sectors. And in this case, I'm thinking of the SMEs. Mm -hmm. And if you support the SMEs, obviously you'll have a disproportionately positive impact on those vulnerable groups, women, et cetera. More generally, central banks need to, um, to begin thinking, and uh, we have been thinking about some long-term, uh, let's say, changes that would, uh, in a sense, uh, have not been as part of our current mandate, but are important for financial stability in the long run. And a clear example here is climate change, which is something that we as central banks around the world are now very much in the, you know, in the driver's seat or leading that whole charge. Yes, thank you. Uh, you mentioned how the emphasis on mobile money, the historical emphasis on mobile money, and technology in Kenya put the country in good standing to respond quickly to the pandemic. And research does suggest that countries that had active digital financial services sectors and that had digitized their tr 
government cash relief transfers and so on, were able to get aid faster to their populations and more easily than other countries did. And, and I think that in part reflects the fact that Kenya has been a home to innovation for many, many years, especially in the case of the M-Pesa non-banks payments services that you've mentioned. Now, the central bank has sought to leverage this innovation in Kenya, and you've sponsored some hackathons, for example, to encourage innovation to think about even topics like health and the pandemic. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the hackathons and what uh, benefits these have brought to Kenya. Yes, Chris. Um, we, the hackathon uh, sort of experience started a year ago, which is when we had in July of 2019, we had our first Afro-Asian FinTech Festival. And uh, it was a global event and connected with uh, um, the, the, fin the um, the fintech financial fintech festival in the in, uh, in Singapore, hmm. which is also organized by the Monetary Authority of Singapore, so we in a sense have been part partnering in this in this regard. And as a consequence, last year we we actually had this hackathon, and uh, all sorts of uh, people from around Africa uh, participated. And in the end, uh, the winners of the hackathon here. Um, uh, we, we brought them to Singapore and indeed uh, we had one of them was in the top 10 finalists um, of the global, um, yeah, the global list in, in, uh, in Singapore. So we were proud of that. Now, all the others actually got, even those that didn't go to Singapore, they did get a lot of mentoring. They also got support in particular ways. So it, it wasn't just uh, the prize wasn't just going to Singapore and participating in that. So that is something that we have uh, wanted and we've been doing, mentoring the young innovators, um, at the same time supporting them in various ways and providing them sort of guidance as needed. So this year, we because of the pandemic, we couldn't do the FinTech Festival the Afro-Asian FinTech Festival. But uh, we decided to have a non-virtual a uh, hackathon. And indeed, there were very interesting uh, um, applications. And uh, all of it was, the, the general question was uh, around health and, uh, you know, the, fin the uh, COVID response, you know, health and economic uh, sort of uh, problems related to COVID. And we had some very interesting presentations um, and uh, we had two uh, two winners that will be sending to the uh, well the overall the global hackathon in Singapore. So this is like very exciting from my perspective because the the solutions that they put forward, I, I mean, some of them are very exciting, um, and you can see that the that uh, you know the human ingenuity and innovativeness of our young people is just uh, mind boggling so i think this is something that we find exciting you could say that that is our night job as opposed to our day job which is <laughs> running the central bank um but i think in the long run this will benefit kenya will benefit africa will benefit the world um these are people that uh, in a few years will you know will be holding their own anywhere um, in the, on this planet. So we feel that uh, we are in some sense privileged to be with them when they are taking their first steps. Well, how wonderful. It's truly exciting and also a little surprising that a central bank is sponsoring such an event. Um, as I mentioned to you earlier, sir, I'm a former central banker and regulator myself. And so I know that the public often views regulators and central bankers as being risk averse people. So, so what's your take on that? How do you square the very serious responsibilities you have to promote stability, safety and soundness and so on with the notion of experimenting with technology that might be untested? Well, Chris, I agree. Uh, central bankers are the only people who you'd be walking with out there, bright day, and you sort of tell them, hey, excellent day, isn't it? And they'll say, yes, it is, but it may rain in the afternoon. <laughs> so in some sense, uh, they are risk averse, but I think uh, it is that the business of central banking is also about looking at the risk and measuring the risk and taking response to avoid sort of the catastrophic uh, um, results. So that's well, really why we are central bankers. But with regard to, <clears throat> to the specific question, 
I think the role of central banking is changing, or rather the, the characterization of what a central bank does is changing. And, uh, and I think that is inevitable because our society is changing. At the end of the day, um, the priority, of course, has to be on, uh, on the, on the fast mandate, which is macro stability, inflation, et cetera, but, uh, and financial stability. But I think the other elements are important, particularly if we take a long-term view um, about where the financial sector will be going. So it is in, in that context that the central bank's uh, new role is being found. It's not that they should extend into what I would call fiscal, uh, quasi-fiscal operations. They shouldn't do that. Um, those should really be left to the appropriate authority. But I think um, the direction is determined by looking forward and seeing what would happen to the financial sector and therefore uh, taking, let's say, actions that would, uh, in some sense, minimize um, the, the catastrophic risk of uh, um, you know, a bad outcome in the financial sector. Well, that's very helpful. Fun. I'm sorry, go ahead, sir. I was going to say it's also fun, you know. So yes. Oh, I it's tremendous fun. Yes. Yeah, yes. I look forward to seeing some of those uh, events go forward and, and some of the technology that comes out of there. And I should say your comment about always being prepared for rain. For many, many years, I always carried a briefcase in my briefcase an umbrella, which was good training for working in Seattle, I have to say, <laughs> with the Gates <laughs> Foundation. Very good. Very good. Let's return to the subject of financial inclusion. Now, Kenya is an exemplar in many ways for policymakers and regulators who seek to alleviate poverty by promoting the use of digital tools for the unbanked and the underbanked. And, and there have been studies done by the economists Billy Jack at Georgetown University and Tavneet Suri at MIT that have found that the adoption of, say, the mobile payments infrastructure in Kenya lifted about 200,000 Kenyan households, almost a million people, out of extreme poverty. And today, over 80% of Kenyans own a financial account of some kind, a, a near doubling since 2011. So the central bank has clearly played a key role in this success. What do you define as the key elements of a central bank's efforts to promote inclusion? And, and what other partners did the central bank need to be so successful to date? Thank you. Um, I think first and foremost, uh, the, the technology that was brought to the central bank um, to make transfers that allowed you to make transfers from one person to another, P2P transfers. Um, at that point, it was just a technology. And uh, there was a specific need. Um, people in the cities wanting to transfer money to their families in the rural areas, etc. So there was a, a unique need and uh, this technology tried to fill that need. And I, and I think that is one element, um, which is technology by itself um, doesn't, uh, doesn't cut it. I mean, if you're, I mean, you can get excited about, a te about technology, but at the end of the day, we have to ask ourselves, what is the problem that is being resolved? You know, so it's always about people in that sense. And so here, there was a clear uh, answer. And uh, the issue then was to minimize the risk um, of this product. And I think the second element here was the collaboration between the innovator and the central bank. Both parties needed to take some risk and uh, needed to understand um, at what point are they OK to let, uh, to try the system as it were, to try the, the product. And so in that sense, the central bank was, was innovative, truly innovative in willing um, to deal with this product. And uh, obviously with the understanding that if, uh, the, the, if it began to raise significant financial stability issues, then it's gonna be pulled off the wall, you know, kind of thing, you know. But that is another element of collaboration. Interestingly, there were no laws when this product was put in place in 2007, there wasn't a law that you can say we licensed them under this uh, act of parliament, whatever. The laws only came in 2013. So during that period, there was that sense of, okay, we will regulate you as an exception. And we, we know what limits we are giving you. And both sides understood 
um, the the sort of the 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 limits within which that they, they are operating. So that's the second element of collaboration, etc. Um, I think the the other the other elements of uh, the success of this, um, in my mind, was that in time it became clear. Well, actually, there was a the other element which was important here was that uh, it it did not displace cash. This is an important point because, as a matter of fact, there were other there was a network of agents that developed around the country um, where people could cash in and cash out. So withdraw cash, you know, go to cash and and uh, sort of your wallet on your phone, etc. So that was important. And I think without that network, the, the pace would have been slower. But I think on the whole, the, the, as you look forward, other, um, this, this technology was scalable, not just in the context of uh, um, the P2P transfers, but also in the context of other, um, let's say, development of an ecosystem, not just of transfers, but also of other services that developed around it. That in itself is a success of, uh, of the, initial, um, the, the initial innovation. And uh, actually, I would want to see somebody redo those numbers that, uh, that you mentioned by Jack and Tavnit. Um, and because I really think now the benefits are much more than the 2% that they mentioned. Uh, and uh, from our perspective, a lot more people have been lifted out of poverty um, and even ourselves that maybe are not at uh, poverty levels have benefited from uh, this technology. I mean, as I have said before, um, I don't remember the last time I actually had a cash transaction. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, with a phone, that's it. But when I go to London, yes, I'm required to do some sort of cash transactions, which I find really odd. And Interesting. And yes, it's probably time to revisit some of those studies and, and to take a look at the progress that's been made. Now, since so much progress has been made, uh, well over 80% of Kenyans have an account of some, time, some kind today. W what's next in terms of inclusion? You mentioned earlier, for example, access and use as being important. So, so what are you thinking about next in this space? Actually, for me, this, uh, this has developed into an elaborate ecosystem. Um, and uh, to really push on the use, uh, not just uh, access. Access is fine, and yes, there's some ways to go. Um, I mean, I, I'm not, it's true we're at 82%, uh, and therefore there is still um, some ways to go to 100, but I think the point here is that the, 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 the focus should now be more on uh, use. Mm which means there has to be specific services and the services that, you know, come to the top of my mind, you know, in terms, you know, one of which is, uh, for instance, savings, savings products, new savings products. And uh, again, as we said before, um, whatever technology you put in place, it has to be uh, for the people, meaning resolving a specific issue. And I think there is uh, a need for a savings product or savings products you know, particularly for people in the lower end of uh, the income end or, or society. So, for instance, somebody who earns only $5 a day, they could earn $5 a day, they could probably save $1 a day. And at the end of the month, they have $30, which they could save in government securities. So we have product we have a product that uh, is aimed at that. It's called Emma Kiba, um, and we are refining it. Um, so there are those specific services. There's another service that I think, uh, if you think about um, changing people's lives, it seems that 70% of the shocks, and this you'd know, Chris, 70% of the shocks that drive people back into poverty are actually health-related. Hmm. So you could think of having some sort of micro insurance product. And micro, we mean micro, micro, you know, sort of uh, gives insurance uh, to, let's say, um, a mother or somebody who is selling a fruit seller at the, at the street corner for two days or three days of insurance when they fall sick, well, income, three days of income when they fall sick. And that will allow them to take the child to hospital or they themselves go to hospital. And that will be significant in terms of uh, um, the long-term benefit of this person 
as one can. So there are things like that. Um, at the end of the day, our objective is the democratization of financial services. That I think is really the vision that we have. I mean, you and I um, have a whole ra range of financial services that we can uh, call upon and you know efficient, etc. But not everybody has that. And one can consider, aside from just the democratization, sort of going up the pyramid in terms of the various other services that uh, can be put on the uh, on the uh, platform, meaning this uh, mobile platform. I think it's very exciting. And uh, I really think there's a lot of innovative ideas that will come into this, uh, to, into play, um, that will really change the landscape of some of the products out there. Thank you. I th we at the Gaines Foundation would be in complete agreement that it's more than just access, it's also use and having good use cases for people to make use of a digital account. And so the Makiba product, as you said, democratizes your ability to invest and savings product helps you to build your own financial cushion so that families can be financially stable and withstand uh, potential shocks. Um, so Governor, we could easily carry on this conversation for much longer. I would love to have that opportunity, perhaps on an another occasion. But I did want to mention that we have a number of students watching this event from the University of Michigan and beyond, as well as central bankers from around the world in all different kinds of countries who are watching you. And so I was wondering if you could leave us with some words of inspiration because your comments have been so inspirational so far. And what would you advise to central bankers who want to make a difference in their countries and in, in the world more generally to, to make, leverage their abilities to serve the public good? What recommendations would you have for them? And what recommendations would you have for students who are trying to figure out how they can get to a life of meaning and purpose? Wow. <laughs> well, Chris, this is a tough one. Um... I guess, well, I don't know. I, I guess my view would be, I mean, first you need to um, to be to throw yourself into your work, but not just to do work, not just to be at the top, but uh, to make a difference in your work. And you make a difference in your work not because you are doing the most, uh, you know, remarkable project. Um, even if the, it's a very mundane, very ordinary sounding ordinary looking report whatever it is you know throw yourself into that uh, project you know 100 percent and do a good job technically but i think at the same time is look at your job as a calling uh, a calling to change the world most of us and particularly the students i'm sure they they want to change the world in some way you have this ambition that is very good and we have to maintain we have to keep up that ambition we shouldn't be jaded when you get into, I don't know, midlife and uh, have some sort of midlife crisis or whatever it is. You know, um, no, I think we have to maintain it. You know, we, I think our calling as professionals is actually to change the world, and uh, in whatever we do. So let's focus on that. We change the world in our in what we do directly, but also in combination with others. And this is where I think more for the students. I think uh, where you are today, it is good training ground for being, um, you know, really pushing yourself in your studies. But I would add, it is important not to be just one track minded. So get involved in other things. Um, get involved in things that are not exactly uh, in your, you know, in economics or whatever else it is. It is important to expand our, um, our vision beyond uh, beyond just our main um, line of specialization. As a matter of fact, in doing all those things, you begin to see other, other aspects of yourself that you didn't know before. Um, so I think those are the ideas I would sort of throw at you. Um, be ready to make mistakes. Actually, that's a good one. That's an important one. You should not be afraid to make mistakes. Learn from the mistakes. As a matter of fact, uh, at times the people are frightened to do things because they fear they may fail. Um, I think that's terrible. Um, there will be many failures. As a matter of fact, uh, um, the, the products that we talked about, I mean, they weren't perfect when they started off. Um, they, they actually had to be revised many times um, before they, were, they, you know, they could see the light of day, you know, sort of like the, uh, the, yeah, the beta version, et cetera. So I think 
um, that is something we need to remember that, yeah, we, we should make, we should not be afraid to make mistakes. And uh, finally, you know, have fun. I think it's important to have fun to, and do things that, you know, that you're passionate about. If you like cycling, if you like football, if you like running, um, all these things, don't just be one track minded. You know, I think we, we, we should expand our vision of things and, uh, and learn from others. So be bold, have broad horizons, get involved and work with and learn with others and don't be afraid of failure. What wonderful yes. advice for everyone, Governor. Governor Jiroge, today we've covered everything from how central banks can prepare for the unknown and how central bankers and even students can prepare themselves to build a better world. Thank you so much for sharing with us your vision and inspiration and for showing us a little bit about what the central bank of the future might look like. And with that, let's return to the final online breakout sessions being hosted by our colleagues at the University of Michigan and the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Chris. I enjoyed this.